Do you mean like sort of on? Uh, I guess I love you. Tragedy struck. I see you haven't lost your touch. Hey, 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 pro nerds. It's Iggy here, and I'm with a very special host, Trojo, for this episode <laughs> of the Nerdcast. What's up, Trojo or Aaron? Yeah. Oh, hey, Iggy. <laughs> What's going on? I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm happy that you're here, too. It's exciting ahead of you going to your first convention with us as a team and everything like that. But before we get into all that, let's talk a little bit about the business stuff, as in our sponsor. So big shout out to Geek Garage. Uh, that's geek-garage.com for sponsoring the Nerdcast. So the Nerd Nerdcast is, of course, brought to you by them. But head on over to geekgarage.com to see some of the world's coolest geek and pop culture themed vehicles, as well as stay up to date on events and even register your own nerdy vehicle that's geekgarage.com geek-garage.com and you can check out a brand new wonder mini over there that's i'm excited about to see how that build comes in but let's let's introduce our guest because as all our nerd casts now have is a special guest and today uh we're bringing in one of uh, uh colorado's own stan yan so hello stan welcome yay the crowd's hello. cheering in the background you can't <laughs> you know, we'll add it in post i guess i don't know but yes stan how's it going <laughs> Oh, it's going all right. Uh, busier than ever, believe it or not. <laughs> all right. So Stan is an artist. Wait, you're, you're an artist. You're kind of a, you make kids books, character, character art, uh, do all kinds of things. I've seen you from, I, and we'll try to figure out, I, I think I remember the venue we met, but I've seen you go from doing characters at parties all the way to set up a San Diego Comic-Con, you know, for Comic-Con International. So you kind of do it all. Yeah, I, I guess so. I, sometimes I feel like it, although I, I feel like, um, you know, everything that I'm doing now, at least, is is towards the goal, at least. Um, well, I mean, actually, before I started, uh, um, well, actually, kind of halfway between doing conventions, I was kind of doing it all, because uh, uh, as we had talked about before we started recording, I went to the University of Colorado but not the art school like your co-host did. <laughs> I, I went to the Leeds School of Business uh, and studied accounting of all things. It's very, uh, very different from art. <laughs> very different, yes, yes. I mean, um, at the end of the day, if you're if you're kind of doing your own art business, you gotta you still gotta know how to work the numbers, right? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't really know that that you know, majoring in, in business really was what helped me, but it kind of helped me get a foot in the door with what I did for the next 13 years, which was, I, I was a stockbroker. So um, okay. I thought, I think the more um, valuable skills that I learned along the way were the, you know, customer relations, dealing with clients, being able to read um, the contracts since there's a lot of contracts in the financial business because it's highly litigious, <laughs> as you can imagine. And, um, um, and and really just, you know, it. I was a horrible salesperson in that industry, but it gave me the skills because I was trying to sell things that I had no personal connection to. So, you know, when I started doing my art full time for a living, um, there's nothing closer to me than that. And it makes selling uh, what I do and knowing what I can do and not worrying that, you know, a chief financial officer is lying on their, you know, financial statements or something like that, uh, just that much easier. So, I, you know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, as much as, as uh, a freelance artists complain about the um, uh, irregular income stream, I feel like uh, I've got a more stable income stream in this industry than I had in my previous industry. <laughs> that's, that's fair. That's very fair. So, um, and, and, you and, know, it was something I was always doing anyway. I mean, even when right. I was a stockbroker, I had actually started going to, well, San Diego Comic-Con was actually the second convention that I ever went to. Really? Uh, as an exhibitor. And, uh, well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't count, like, you know, the swap meets, the guys with their long boxes of, of comics that their wife forced them to get rid of out of their basements right. and things like that. But uh, um, as far as like a, a real legitimate large convention, um, I think it's kind of funny that you like built it up to the San Diego Comic Con because that's kind of where I started. Really? That's impressive. <laughs> yeah. Talk about a baptism by fire. <laughs> right. So, Aaron, you were doing some research on Stan before we got started, and I think, Stan, you already alluded to it, but you went to see you as well for arts. Yeah. And kind of, 
similar. Yeah, so I was definitely uh, stalking your bio a little bit <laughs> just to <laughs> see. And I am also from Colorado and I went to school in Boulder as well. But originally, um, I, I did end up getting a degree in studio art and sociology. So it was very, it wasn't very specialized, um, mm -hmm. anything like that. Uh, but then I just dabble in art on the side as well. So I think it's very interesting that you did such a great career switch after so many years of being in a completely different industry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I felt like I hit the ground running and, and my income was so paltry in the financial industry that it wasn't really that big of a change. I mean, if, I, mean I always joke that, you know, I started freelancing full time with my the blessing of my wife but she probably was relieved that I started doing that instead because then, you know, the income was a lot, uh, a lot more level. I, and part of it is because I don't just do art, you know, I don't just freelance. I also teach, uh, like at first I started teaching uh, a bunch of uh, comic and cartooning summer camps for kids around town. And then uh, I got hired on at the community college of Aurora to teach um, and, and develop a, a degree program in graphic storytelling. And uh, and then I went on a sabbatical from teaching when I figured out that that was actually what was holding back my overall income. <laughs> and then, uh, and more recently, I got sucked back into teaching. Uh, my old boss at the Community College of Aurora started uh, working as the chair of the illustration department at uh, Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. So I'm teaching there as well. So. I, I kind of split things between um, my teaching income and um, my gig income, which includes like doing caricatures for birthday parties, weddings, corporate events, and then also, um, and then of course, uh, you know, trying to sell my books and doing cons and things like that, which um, kind of went away over the pandemic. Right. right. Um, but fortunately for me, there were other opportunities. I mean, actually, right before uh, all the pandemic lockdowns is when I got hired on at Remcad. So the time, the you know, the the timing couldn't have been better. Um, so that helped to smooth out some of my income. And I, I still didn't make as much, but you know, I also didn't have all the expenses. And you know, I literally didn't drive for three months at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and we weren't getting out. And so there's always like two sides of the coin. And then of course, no, no travel expenses, hotel expenses, right. you know, uh, right. cost con tables or anything like that. So um, I was saving a lot of money on that end. Yeah. I think I was, I think at some points in time in 2020, I put maybe one tank of gas in my car across three or four months like <laughs> right? there. Yeah. yeah. It's insane. Yeah, well, you know, and then to boot, I'd, I'd bought a Prius, which has been great when I was, you know, driving. <laughs> Doing all the driving. Boy, talk about, you know, I, I don't think I'm ever going to have to go in for my next periodic uh, servicing for that car. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, I know a big thing that kind of took a hit and in, in, or was your one of your big hits, excuse me, to better put it, and you kind of alluded to. Uh, was of course there's, there's a zombie in the basement, which we'll get to, because that's where I we first saw you with that, and I was trying to think oh, back, and I think I came I to the place where we went. back than that. I thought I think you were advertising the Kickstarter is when we. Oh, first oh met. okay, yeah. So yeah. I think, and if I remember correctly, it was Mr. Was this Mr. Z or Mr. X? He had that short-lived comic shop. And he did that creator event where a bunch of us set oh, up. And I think is that Carl was out there. Lee Oaks okay. was out there. And it was a blizzard. So we all just hung out oh, and right. like, talked the <laughs> whole time. Right. <laughs> um, it was crazy. So Aaron, it was a Saturday set up. And they promoted it. Brand new comic shop. He did this huge weekend. There was like eight or ten of y'all. Like some very well-known local people in. Yeah. And we came out there to set up. We even had our publishing comics. But also we're doing the Project Nerd interviews. And just... I think within a half hour setting out, it just started coming down. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I nobody besides the people that anybody knew came in. So it was more of just a hangout all day. Right. Yeah. Just get to know the people that are already there. <laughs> it, it's kind of like uh, the old, these old school small press comic conventions where I was convinced, I mean, that no one actually uh, entered the front door, but there was just like one $5 bill going all the way through the convention. <laughs> <center>. <laughs> Every table. <laughs> 
Um, it was, yeah, everybody was buying up each other's. I've, we've got, I got some of your work. I know I have still stacks of Carl's stuff. I've been in touch with Lee. I can't remember who else was all there, but there was a, it was a good turnout on the artist and creator side. But yeah, I think that was the year you were promoting this. Cause I remember you had a, you had the prototype stuff animal. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, yeah. Wait, that was kind of interesting because, you know, it was, um, um, for a year there, I, I was, uh, trying to um, sell this uh, or, or get an agent or sell this to a, a publisher. So I was sending it out and uh, I just joined the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators and at their um, at the regional conference, um, uh, author and illustrator Selena Yoon uh, was doing the, she was one of the keynotes and she was one of the um, uh uh, she, she was doing the illustrators intensive and that was actually our project was we were she was teaching us how to put together uh dummy books that look just like the real thing and so i'm like well you know i'm not doing like board books like she was she had books with all these turning dials and flaps and everything like that right. but she also taught us how to make things that look like a hardcover book so it was it was totally made up of stuff that i printed off of my inkjet printer and uh you know glue sticks spray mount <laughs> uh, some board and i you know pasted it all together and so for the year that i was trying to sell this to publishers i just started taking it around to different events and uh, in a lot of these events i was actually sitting people in my booth and i was drawing zombie caricatures of them and uh, i had the the dummy book sitting there saying read me and uh so while I was drawing them, uh, you know, they, they had a chance normally to read the book cover to cover. I mean, it was a three minute read and uh, it wasn't unusual for people like, ah, oh, can I buy this? I'm like, no, no. Did you even notice that only three of the pages were cover colored? You know? right. <laughs> and but I'm like, but you can sign up for my mailing list on my, you know, on this clipboard and I'll let you know, you know, if it is getting published with the timetable is on it or if i have to crowdfund it um you know uh i'll let you know when that's happening and um I, you know this was only my second kickstarter that i tried launching on my own and i was able to actually get uh, over the year 2000 people on my mailing list um, doing this so that that helped um, quite a bit when I got around to crowdfunding it. And, uh, you know, and, and honestly, I feel like that was the least successful part of the whole process because I've been able to do school visits and, and whatnot and sell so many books that I'm on my third, um, uh, third printing right now of this book. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, I was going to actually ask how well that came together. And I think as somebody who's done Kickstarters myself, people, think it's you just throw it on Kickstarter and hope it goes. Oh, no. but I mean, the, the two, the two, two first do, Kickstarters yeah. I did, I actually was promoting that I was going to do the Kickstarter a year ahead of time. So, right. so yeah. yeah, it takes a lot of that. Kind, promoting. Kind of I get think 2000 people, people on the it, list yeah. is impressive. Yeah. And it was, it was um, a lot easier when, when I was um, uh, actually able to go to conventions because, you know, you could talk to people about it because at that time, um, I was uh, the first Kickstarter I did was to redraw and reprint um, uh, my first uh, my Vincent Price comic book, which uh, the original was illustrated by Dan Crozier, uh, mm -hmm. and he may have been one of the artists that was there. He was actually yes, Dan yeah. was there. That's right. And and so, but so what had happened was I actually raised the prices of my uh, zombie characters because I, I noticed that the people that were buying zombie characters from me wouldn't buy any books. So they weren't book buyers at all. They were just, you right. know, I, I want this to commemorate that I'm here, you know, uh, cosplaying or, you know, uh, going to panels or getting uh, photo ops with celebrities or whatever. And so I'm like, well, maybe I can force them to read. So I, I would like raise my, the price of my zombie characters by exactly the amount of the cover price of the book. And, and it was a, it was a, a story about me doing zombie caricatures of people at a convention. So there's a meta <laughs> aspect to it as well. And uh, so I'm like, well, they'll buy a comic book, whether they like it or not. And so I just <laughs> slide it into the back of their drawing when I was done. 
And, and then I was like, well, you know, after a couple of years of doing this, I'm like, I feel a little weird about giving someone, someone something that I didn't draw after I just drew them. So I talked to Dan, I talked to um, Blue Otter Productions to see whether they would be okay with me doing kickstarting a, um, a version of this book that I wrote, uh, I mean, I illustrated. And uh, so for a year, you know, while I'm drawing people, I was telling them that, you know, they could get drawn into the next print edition of this book. I was going to do a Kickstarter and some of the uh, incentive levels were to get drawn in my book as some of the characters. And then the top incentive level was, you know, you get everything and then you get to be the villain in the book. <laughs> the uh the the character that basically kills me off at the end <laughs> so everybody, was, everybody was fighting for that one huh no but i was i actually wasn't expecting someone to to step up and purchase that one and and someone <laughs> that i don't even know if he was familiar with my work or how he found out about me i think it was because i had dropped off some advertisements at uh, mile high comics or something like that and uh, I think that's probably how he found out about me. And then he, lo and behold, one day uh, during the, um, and, and this was not like late into the thing. It was like pretty early in the campaign. Uh, I sold that uh, um, that incentive, you know, the top incentive level. And, and then he reaches out to me and we talk. We get actually got together. We did another event at Mile High Comics where, I got him to sign copies of the book too, because <laughs> he was he was in it. <laughs> there you go. So you get multiple signatures in that in that one. That's a yeah. yeah. Um, people are probably like, oh yeah, I think he's in the book. I better get his signature. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was the one that made him do it. <laughs> oh man, yeah. Um, I'm like, so, you're here. Why why don't you sign it? <laughs> You mentioned Dan. I think just this will air ahead of it, so you're gonna probably. I'm assuming you're gonna be at Colorado Festival of Horror this September. I am not scheduled to actually. Oh, okay. But yeah, I mean, I actually me hadn't assume. planned on doing any um, larger uh, events um, this year, just because I didn't know how COVID was gonna go, and I'm kind of glad about that because yeah, we still don't know things, how it's gonna the, go. The trends are not good right now. Yes. And my, my son is like a year too young to get um, uh, vaccinated. So I, I worry about that. And he's going back to school uh, next week or something like that. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, my daughter's 11, well, uh, turning 11 and just started this week too. Yeah, so I feel you on that. Yeah. Um, but uh, it is one, and Dan is a great guy, and he was there at that event. But um, more shout-outs to him and the local people. But I, I noticed too, you sent over the pictures – Obviously, there's a zombie in the basement. Again, I mentioned that was a huge hit. I was looking at your website right now. It's April 2016. So maybe we did meet you before that. I do remember that yeah. event, but maybe we did meet before that because I was out here a good year plus before that. Um, but there's the other one here, too, that I just pulled up on the screen um, that you sent over. Tell us a little bit about this. Oh, project. yeah. So this is kind of the what, what uh, zombie in the basement is evolving into. So yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still in the process of, of trying to sell uh, kids graphic novels to, you know, large trade publishers and whatnot. And one of my projects features a character that looks eerily like the uh, zombie girl in uh, There's a Zombie in the Basement. Um, but I, I kind of redesigned her and uh, created this world um, uh, for a project called Salem Charter Academy. And uh, it's a story about uh, two zombie kids that uh, have been whole, uh, homeschooled their whole life. And uh, their mad scientist father gets some secret government contract <laughs> and is forced to enroll them in uh, a school that recent, was founded by witches, but recently opened their doors in the spirit of diversity to all monsters. And clearly <laughs> they're not ready for it yet. There's... Uh, you know, all sorts of very witch centric curriculum and, and things like that. So um, that's kind of the story. And, and it's actually spawned all these other projects that I'm, I've been working on, including a comic strip that's a weekly strip featuring uh, her little brother as the main character, Peter Cadaver. And it runs every Sunday uh, on this website called the Sunday Haha, -Ha, which is like a virtual comics page for kids. Um, and so he's, uh, uh, I, have been running that, um, 
it was on a temporary basis. I started like a four strip um, uh, stint in January, and then I started full time in um, uh, in June. So um, hopefully, I can keep up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hopefully, it helps you know bring some attention to this this world that I'm I'm building, and and maybe some publishers and whatnot. That's right. really cool. That sounds demanding, <laughs> but fun, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, heck, uh, I didn't choose this. It shows me because <laughs> I think anyone would be insane to, you know, try to do this because it was easy money because it's definitely not. Um, in fact, uh, one of the keynote uh, illustrators at one of the Rocky Mountain chapter of Society Children's Book Writers and Illustrators conferences was Dan Yaccarino, who um, is a, a really well-established children's book illustrator. He also did a bunch of stuff in animation and his keynote was about um, saying yes to everything. Even if he didn't know whether or not he could do it, he'd just say yes to it. And that's what opened all these doors for him. And then the one thing that, uh, and he, he actually did a portfolio review for me and saw like my, my uh, uh, graphic novel stuff and, and you know, ask me about that and to ask me, you know, where I saw myself in five years and, and encouraged me to, to keep going with the graphic novel thing, because that was, you know, something that was a really quickly growing industry in uh, children's books, uh, because there wasn't, I mean, you know, we have Raina Telminger's Smile and the, the Babysitter's Club, but that was really kind of the beginning of these children's book trade publishers getting into graphic novels. And that was them just dipping their toe in the water. And um, uh, but anyway, he gets up and does his uh, closing keynote and then mentions that the only thing that he hasn't done because you'd be crazy to do it was graphic novels because of the amount of work. I'm like, wait a minute, you said yes to everything else. And then you advise me to pursue something that even you, of all things, are not crazy enough to try. <laughs> yeah, it is It is so much work. It is for sure. I Well, I know a lot about a lot of the stuff. Aaron, I think you just now meeting Stan. What kind of things are on your mind to ask him that I probably wouldn't even think about? Well, first of all, I was wondering... Um, do you primarily illustrate digitally? Do you do old school drawings, markers, watercolors? That yeah, I started um, traditionally, uh, but I've I've gravitated and migrated to all digital just because I'm afraid of the editorial process and what they're going to make me change and yeah. my ability to take traditionally rendered artwork and modify it to my satisfaction so that the edits look just as good, or maybe it's just way too much work. You know, I, I've heard stories of people that, you know, worked in traditional media and I mean, they were doing, you know, watercolor acrylic paintings of picture book pages and finished the whole book. And then the art director, like there's something bugging me about it. And they made them draw uh, paint the whole book all over again. Yeah. Oh, paper. I can't imagine. <laughs> and I'm like, if I was working traditionally and had to do that, I'd be mad. I mean, in that case, I'm guessing that they just had to totally redraw things or redesign their characters. So it wouldn't have been necessarily a quick fix, um, you know, maybe stylistically. But uh, uh, for me, that's what I'm always thinking of. So I, I want to make sure to have like an archival file that has all the layers. So if they're like, you know what, We're, we want you to change the color of, you know, this character's shirt all the way through, no big deal, you know? <laughs> right, that's a good, yeah. that's a really good point. I didn't even think about it. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's, digital... there's certain projects that I still am working on uh, traditionally. Like I've been working on a graphic novel about my best friend's battle with cancer. And I, I actually do the layouts all digitally, but I, I print out, um, the pencil pages, and then I light box them onto watercolor paper, and I basically redraw the whole thing so that I have original pages that look a lot like what the finished page is going to look like. Because when that book comes out, I, I envisioned um, having like a traveling art show for to go along with the the the, um, the book release or something. So that's very that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Did you have any formal uh, art education after you switched careers or has this been 
a self-taught process the whole way it's, through. It's been a self-taught process. And it's just one of the things that I've been passionate about, not only art, but comic art since my, I mean, my earliest memories of drawing, I was drawing like the same character over and over doing different things in these boxes that later on I found out were comic panel borders. So I was doing <laughs> comics before I even realized it. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, you know, I mean, like I said, I, I was a stockbroker, but during that time, I finished my first three comic books, uh, self-published comic books, my first graphic novel, started taking them to comic conventions during that. Um, I mean, even in college, when I was studying accounting, I did uh, comic strips and editorial comics for the campus press and uh, did an uh, internship uh, as an art director in uh, for an ad agency in New York over one summer as well. So Wow. Um, and, so you're you know, still involved. <laughs> um, kind of. I mean, I, most of that I was just doing for fun anyway. And uh, my first comic books I did really had a limited audience. I originally created them just as kind of inside jokes for my college friends. <laughs> but then I started selling them at these local swap meets and uh, people were enjoying them that I I just met, I mean, total strangers. So I'm like, oh, well, maybe there's something to it. And I think that kind of proved to me that, you know, when you're doing character development for stories that, you know, basing them on... Uh, people that you know, at least on a loose basis, lends them some authenticity in their relationships, some authenticity that kind of, uh, you know, even if they were inside jokes, sometimes they can, you know, bridge the uh, the gap between the stranger and, and the author and, uh, you know, find some common ground there. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> What Did you, you have a favorite like, comic strip when you were growing I, up? I was is there like ask that same thing. <laughs> what's I well, that's, you're that, about that's a good question a because yeah, what's I, I grew up as not a comic book reader. I mean, you know, most of my friends uh, in comics and even out of comics uh, grew up being huge fans of superhero comics. Growing up, that was not me. I was the comic strip guy because I had such a short attention span <laughs> that really three or four panels is about as much attention Fair. as I could give to it. Prince Valiant in the Sunday comics, way too long. Never going to read that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think like the. I mean, there was a lot of comics that I liked, but they were all, you know, just chuckle, you know, the Mort Walker comics. I, I'd say the first comic that was really life-changing, and in retrospect, it wasn't because necessarily the humor was Garfield. And and I think Garfield was the first comic that really struck me for the, um, the really... Uh, um, the, the, the varying line widths. So I don't know if Jim Davis was using like a nib or a brush, but I hadn't really thought about varying my line width with my comics until then. And even after that, I would just like take my razor tip pen and just keep going over and over it. So it was thin on one end, thick on the other end. I didn't realize there were actual tools that you could use right. to create those effects, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then of course, um, Bill Watterson and Calvin and Hobbes hit the scene and that changed <laughs> everything. And, and from a writing standpoint too, I think, oh, at that yeah. point, uh, you know, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't appreciate Garfield anymore because the humor wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> Calvin and Hobbes changed the game. I think yeah. that's, it's a great, and Aaron, that was a great question because that's where my mind was going. As you mentioned, doing this as a kid. But I also find it fascinating that you're not talking about, oh, I'm enjoying reading a cat comic. Like, that's what my daughter would be excited about. You're like, <laughs> right. oh, what's going on with those lines there? Right. I need to figure out how to do that. Like, already right away. It's like you were destined to do this. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, like I said, uh, in my earliest memories is, and, you know, Grant, I, di I didn't have a lot of, uh, um, you know, pride in my artwork when I was a little kid. Yeah, everything was just a stick figure because to me speed was of the essence because I had a story to tell. It, it wasn't art to draw. It was a story to tell. <laughs> and uh, I mean, granted, you know, when I would take art classes and in, uh, in the elementary school, I always did really well and excelled at, at the assignments and everything like that. But uh, I don't think it was really until about eighth grade 
I was playing Dungeons and Dragons with my um, school friends, and they were all like drawing their characters uh, with a shield and a sword. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I'm like, hey, I could do that. Hey, I could do that better, you know? <laughs> so it was like the competitive spirit of it that really started getting me to take a little bit of um, pride in my work, you know, and, and not that I didn't have any semblance of that before. I mean, I can think of very specific times uh, growing up where, you know, my friends would um, compliment me on my artwork. And of course, anytime you get compliments, that's, you know, positive reinforcement. So you're like, oh, I'm doing something right here. You know? <laughs> yeah. But uh, but when it really came down to me, like putting pencil to paper and drawing a story, it was going to be done really fast because I needed to, you know, I couldn't obsess over each panel for an hour because I would never get this comic done, you know, and I was going to get it done before dinner. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But talking about inspirations and, and enjoyments too, I know you prefer it. It sounds like you prefer the smaller events, the smaller communities, but when you do go to the conventions, like what are you excited about as a fan, not just as the creator? Cause you know, some people live um, for hall H like they seriously spend hours in line. Yeah. For and that's, Others, that's yeah, really that's not my scene. Like if I actually take the time to go to a panel, it's, it's on craft. Right. So what really excites me is not going to see, you know, uh, you know, a celebrity, um, but it's it's to see another artist talk about their creation process or to hear from agents talk about you know the types of creators that they like to sign uh, or what industry trends are those are the things that excite me and that's why like you know if if i wasn't exhibiting at san diego comic-con i probably wouldn't be going because of just the insanity that and and it's and it's, it's a, a total like tourist trap everything like goes up in multiples in price when you go out there so um i mean it has networking opportunities and there's normally like in the five days of the con there's like one like thing that i've done where i'm like oh you know maybe that'll turn into something bigger like you know um i i ended up getting uh, my book to R.L. Stein at the Scholastic Party one year. What? <laughs> well, and actually, crazy. at the same party, I got I got a book to Dan, uh, uh, Dan Santat and Raina Telgemeier, but I, I kind of cheated because I was friends with Raina from way back in the day when she was just Xerox copying chapters of Smile, and every year at San Diego, I'd buy the next issue from her, you know, and. Uh, and so we became friends from that. And then um, and then another year, uh, because at, at various Walker Stalker cons, which was a convention that was really mm -hmm. built around the, the Walking Dead show, um, there um, one of the uh, special effects, you know, one of the main special effects guys and, and directors, um, Greg Nicotero, had stopped by our booth uh, a couple of times dur during different conventions um to look at my work and to help us out like he bought a commission for a family of five from us and but but i don't even know if he knew who i was because my friend stacy my booth assistant she was the one that was doing all my business so i could just draw and not worry about it so she'd do all the transactional stuff she'd sell stuff and um so in San Diego, we, we heard that he was going to be there. And that, I think that was maybe the last San Diego Comic-Con that he went to and the last convention that we went to that he was at. So we, we were running this contest to try to get him to come to our booth so we could give him this, this drawing that I did of him attacking Stacy, holding those signs that you have right there. <laughs> so, since I was like, I'm going to draw that because I know he'll recognize Stacy. I don't know if he's going to recognize me. <laughs> and so I drew him as a zombie attacking Stacy with the signs. And um, um, so anyway, so we were trying to get him um, that drawing, and then we we're going to give him a zombie in the basement T-shirt and everything. And so, you know, through the course of the convention, I was running this Instagram 
contest where I announced that, you know, we'd give you a free zombie character if you could get Greg Nick Tarot to come to our table. And everyone, you know, during the course of the convention, oh, yeah, I could get him to come here. Oh, yeah, I get but no one could get him there. So we'd kind of given up on it until Sunday. This lady comes up to our table and she um, uh, is looking at the zombie in the basement book. She's like, oh, my husband would love this. She didn't even open it. She just takes it and so she's looking at all the stuff on uh, on the on the table, and she sees these sketch covers that I did uh, that are you know blank Walking Dead issues that I drew uh, you know different zombie characters on there, and uh, she's like, "Oh, my husband works on this show," and I'm like, "Who's your husband?" And he's like, "Oh, uh, Greg Nicotero." And I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> so like we were able to get him his drawing, get him a T-shirt, and everything like that. Nice, you know, that worked. Like, yeah, just... who, who knows what I'll, that'll turn into? I mean, you know, to date it hasn't turned into anything, but uh, every year at San Diego, there's normally, and normally it's just one thing, you know, uh, and, and over recent years, it's always been like, oh, this is the last year I'm doing San Diego because it seemed like sales are getting worse and worse. And the thing that you could always count on was that your best sales day would be you know, like Saturday. Like if anyone was going to buy a one day pass, it was going to be on Saturday because that's when the big panels were and everything. And and then Sunday, everyone talked about this mythical Sunday bump. You know, people don't buy things, they shop. And then on Sunday, they go and buy. Never happened for us until the last couple of years. And it was always like Saturday being crappy. And the problem with Saturday is that it's true. Everyone was you know that was the day to to go see the biggest stars but that's why they were not down in the exhibit hall <laughs> they were and there were some saturdays over the last few years where we wouldn't make a sale until like two in the afternoon and it was because no one was you know there was no one there to sell anything to. <laughs> right. you know anyone that was in the exhibit hall was running for some convention exclusive and the lady on the pa is like there's no running in the exhibit hall <laughs> i'm like you want a bat <laughs> and and so and, and then finally like the people that had filtered down from the the panel rooms after something that they've been camping out overnight for would finally come down and then we would start making sales and uh and then one of the things that Stacy started doing was she started writing down our, our table number and the row number um, on our business card. So people that were like, eh, I'll think about it. She'd give a business mm. card to. And but the problem was in is where we're set up is in the small press and the, our table numbers have nothing to do with the banners that are hanging from the ceiling. So we are like, well, we're K14, but we're in row 1400. So look for that and go towards the bathroom and then you'll find us again. And lo and behold, like uh, about four, three or four years ago on Sunday, you know, after a Saturday, we're like, I'm not coming back again. I'm not going to apply for my booth again for the first time since 2001, you know, and uh, lo and behold, people were coming back. And the good thing about it was, you know, I was already working on a backlog of drawings. And so People are like, oh yeah, you know, I I came back on Sunday, so they were totally fine with me taking home these commissions as as mail out commissions. And so uh, Sunday, we started getting that Sunday bump. <laughs> right. So I think it was just a matter of figuring out how to get people back to our table because for the longest time, and I do think for the most part at most conventions, when people are like, oh, think about it, that's just a no, you know. But I, at a convention this big, some of those no's were actually, you know, being honest. They just couldn't find us on Sunday. <laughs> right. And I think for people that haven't been to San Diego Comic-Con, you have to understand that the floor is big. But there's other shows that have, I think, even larger floors. So it's packed. And then there's so many things that are happening at the stadium or like you said, Hall H. Yeah. Or it's, you go up to the third floor for the panel, certain panel rooms that's got like 30 or 40 panel rooms going on. So it's not that it's, it's, it's not that you just get lost in the exhibit hall. Right. It's the we're just that, the needle in the haystack that right. they can't yeah, find. It's, you might be three blocks away <laughs> well, partaking and, and in something. There were, you know, before Marvel um, backed out of Comic-Con, which 
really only started to happen uh, after they got bought out by Disney and then they were going to run their own convention in LA. Um, uh, Comic-Con got so big. I mean, they, they actually expanded the, uh, the convention hall since I started going there because the first year I exhibited was in um, 2001 and there was no Hall H. That part of the convention center didn't even exist. It was like a separate building that they built and connected to the rest of the hall. So there was like, I think, A through F. And that was the entire uh, San Diego Convention Center. And so G, H, and everything like where uh, Funko and all the video game companies right. and where the Artist Alley is right now um, didn't exist at all. And, yeah, and so yeah. they expanded that and then um and that was still wasn't enough room so then they started partnering with all these adjacent hotels where you still had to be a badged guest to go to panels and events at the hotel so you'd walk out there or travel out there but you're not going to get in unless you got a badge um so yeah it, it got crazy big so i'm like you know, if you're totally obsessed with anything AMC, because like AMC took over a whole hotel and that's all you did for your convention experience, <laughs> you would never go to the convention hall at right. all. Right. No, I, I people <laughs> just I, get I your badge, maybe. Right. That's about but, it. You know, people that go out there and don't even get the badge because they just hang out because there's so much even going out outside. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's like, I mean, yeah, you, you could go out to the AMC thing and not have a badge because you just need to get that to get into the panels, but they would have this thing going on outside, like where they had set up like a fake hotel for American Horror Story or whatever. And you could still participate, go in there, get some photo ops without a badge. You know? Right. <laughs> so there's so all I... sorts of stuff going on. You know, and there was a, there was a guy that we stayed with uh, that was our Airbnb host. Uh, he didn't have a badge either, but he was going to go down get in a costume and just mill around on gas lamp and everything like that. So that was his convention experience. And so he, he dressed up as Aladdin and uh, he had one of those one wheel, uh, you know, motorized things that he built like a fine <laughs> off of, which was just so clever. He, it was, it was totally cool. <laughs> I like it. That's funny. I like it. Now, I know we have a couple other topics to go on, but before we move sure, on, sure. I do want to talk about the San Diego Comic-Con. So my brightest memory, speaking of Hall H, and because this, I always like to tell the story because it'll annoy tons of people out there who wait in line. People wait in line for like hours. They stay overnight to get in line for Hall H. And we were trying, a group of us, we went there for Project Nerd to do a panel, and we were trying to get back into the Exhibitor Hall. Um, and this was the last year I ran into you there because it was last 2017 was the last year. I went. Oh, okay. and for some reason, security just pushed us. They're like, no, you need to go this way. So they pushed us into this line where a bunch of people were going and we followed the group in and no waiting time. We're standing in Hall H where Kevin Smith's on stage and all this because they accidentally wow. pushed our group in there. And we were like, oh, so many people were pissed <laughs> behind us like because yes. they thought we well, were going to Now that you've like, outed no. yourself, you're going to start getting death threats and hate mail. <laughs> right. <laughs> For sure. So I had I had one big question, and then I know I wanted to go back to the Stacy thing too. But the big question was: Is you talking about zombies, and you got went back to The Walking Dead? So I always liked um, when we talk with Tony Moore. He talks about he likes making zombies because you can kind of make it your own. And he always uses the example because yeah. he's done Deadpool as well. And when he does mm -hmm. the Deadpool zombie, he can do whatever he wants to the character. Right. Is that something that attracts you to doing zombies or is there something oh, else? Oh, totally. I mean, there's there's you? so much story built. I mean, I'm a storyteller, if you haven't figured that out already. Right. <laughs> but there's like so much story just built into a zombie character illustration because, you know, first of all, you know, there's always arguments. I mean, if, if you've been to any zombie panel about what really is a zombie. So I have like all, like if, if you look at my commission sheet, I, I've created this, this, uh, a uh, carbonless form that has like all these different uh, types of zombies. So you could be a traditional rotting zombie, you know, uh, which you would see on Romero or, or Walking Dead. You've got your mad. Okay. And you, you can argue about this, but I consider Frankenstein a type of zombie back from the dead. So mm -hmm. I, I consider, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I call mad that's science zombies. So even, even like, you know, 
Sally from Nightmare Before Christmas, granted, she's more of a doll, but I would consider that a zombie. And the only reason I added that one is one year, you know, one of the reasons I started doing zombies was because I was always afraid of doing caricatures. And so when I started doing characters, I started doing zombie characters because I'm like, well, people would expect to look awful then. That was a lot right. of <laughs> There's more wiggle <laughs> room for me. Looking awful because that's my job is to make you look awful, right? Well, then, of course, one year someone's like, can you make me a sexy zombie? And I was like thinking about that, like sexy zombie. What What is that? So I'm like, well, maybe I just draw like a flattering caricature and then put stitches all over them. Like, and you could be kind of cute, like, you know, Sally from Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, and so that's why I added that one. And then, of course, that opened the can of worms to like all different types of things like uh, Resident Evil zombies, which was really the thing that got me into the zombie genre in the first place was playing the Resident Evil video game. <laughs> there you go. So, so, and then, of course, that was basically the catch all for everything because, you know, the zombies in Resident Evil throughout the games evolved and they became you know more complicated and and would just mutate and everything like that so i'm like okay anything goes <laughs> right so okay. uh so that's yeah that, that, that that's uh that's and, and so so there's that and then of course um you know what is the zombie doing so do i draw them like attacking the viewer so then that's another part of the story and then do they have any uh, like defensive injuries, like arrows sticking out of them, chunks that have been blasted off of them? So that was always fun for me to draw zombie characters because <laughs> of the uh, of all the story that goes into it, you know. And then when The Last of Us came out, I started uh, doing these fungal zombies. And of course, you know, I didn't do them exactly the way they did in the video game because I always wanted to add all these delicious edible mushrooms on top of them as well. So we've got some shiitake mushrooms here. <laughs> so, so, you know, but I, I don't know. I mean, that, that may be something that has kind of gone by the wayside just because, you know, as you were getting to, you know, unfortunately, uh, during this pandemic lockdown, uh, Stacy passed away. And right. she was like my sales assistant that I trusted and, and really, you know, honestly, my best friend. So it was, um, and, and, you know, for a little while there, I was thinking about, gosh, you know, do I want to keep doing these live commissions at comic book conventions when I'm really trying to transition into um, being more of an author and illustrator of children's graphic novels and you know what was that going to do to my presence at uh conventions so you know you know her unfortunate passing has kind of become a little bit of a pivot point in my career where you know maybe my goals at conventions are going to be a little bit different than they had been you know because for a long time you know i started I, well i started doing uh caricatures at conventions as a way of making extra money because when I got laid off from my uh, financial career and decided I was going to do this full time, I actually had to figure out not only how to foster growing my fan base, but also, you know, to um, actually make money at conventions. And I, I saw a lot of my friends uh, doing commissions for people at conventions. And so I'm like, well, maybe I can do some fan based caricatures of people. But like I said, I was afraid of what people might think about how I drew them. So that's why I started doing the zombie caricature thing. And fortunately for me, you know, the zombie thing kind of took off. And uh, I started doing these conventions where, you know, I felt like I was neglecting customers because I was so busy trying to get these commissions done. And, and honestly, at some of these conventions, I was bringing back all the books that I brought and having sold none of them, you know? So I'm like, well, what am I really doing at this convention? And, and granted, in the defense of my customers, my comics at that time were kind of just sick and twist slice life books that didn't have anything to do with zombies. And uh, so a lot of the people that became my fans, that you know, every year would come back, like, you got anything new? I'm like, no, unfortunately I didn't because I started teaching the summer camps at that time. And so I had like no time to work on my own projects. And so um, at the first uh, Denver Comic-Con, I was like, you know, I, I want to try to see whether or not I can 
actually make a lot more money um, by having like a 10 by 10 uh, curtain booth, you know? And so it was the first year they had discounted prices. I didn't have any, really any uh, overhead because they were local uh, other than, you know, the cost of parking at the convention center. Right. So I'm like, let's, let's go for it, but I'm going to need some help. And uh, in 2010, um, I was sharing a booth with uh, her roommate, uh, Chris Salas. And so she came out with us and was kind of helping us with sales. And unfortunately for me, I lost my voice that year. And so she was actually helping me to uh, sell my books because I couldn't, I couldn't project at all. And uh, so just from that experience, um, I knew that I, I could trust her to, to do a good job of and be really proactive about selling me. And so I hired her on to be my booth assistant and, you know, I'd made more money there than by multiples than I'd made at any convention before. And, and I was like paying her a 25% commission on top of everything. So I'm like, okay, uh, this, this can work. And so I, I started taking her to every convention that I went to. So even like some of the smaller local conventions, like, uh, you know, Rocky Mountain Con, uh, NDK, um, you know, uh, Mile High Con, and uh, uh, what were some of the other conventions uh, that we were doing locally? But I, I, I could actually do a comparison year after year. And, you know, I was you know, at least tripling my revenue at every single one of those conventions, just having her with me so that I didn't have to worry about anything but drawing, you know? Yeah. And uh, so it was more than worth, uh, uh, you know, paying her the 25%. And, uh, you know, honestly, um, you know, we, we became really good friends out of the whole thing. So, um you know, we because we spent so much time with each other at all of these events. You travel with me, and it was something that was was really rewarding for her versus, you know, what she had done for her regular day jobs, which was you know working at Lowe's, which sucked. <laughs> so. Well, I I think that's great, and hopefully her inspiration does help you. Yeah, uh, I mean, the thing that was really good was you know once I finally realized that that all of these, these, you know, I was making more money, but I was losing sight of what I really wanted to promote. That was when, um, you know, I decided to do that uh, Kickstarter for the Vincent Price book. So I had something to promote. And then hot on the heels of that, I did my children's book, which is, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, it kind of took taken on a life of its own. So. Right, right. Well, definitely. Oh, it's a great story. Stan, I, you're filled with great stories, I think, but we're getting pretty close to time here. So. I know. I could just I blather on forever. I, you know, I, I love this too. And I miss it so much too, because all these conversations, all the people we've connected with over the years, that's why I was excited to reach out to you and get right. back in touch because it has, I just, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, there's so many faces as I'm talking to Aaron about it too. I'm like, you got to meet this person. You're going to have to meet this person. You're going to have to meet this person with the brand. Right. So many. Uh, and you're that, definitely that was one kind of, of the, the nice thing about those small conventions is because I wasn't doing like the massive amount of, of commissions that I could actually talk to people like this, right. which, you know, I really missed because I was not really, you know, like I said, Stacy was kind of faced in my booth at some of these busier conventions like Walker Stalker and San Diego, you know? So no, for sure. But, for but sure. going to like Dink was really refreshing because I got to wander around and talk to people a little bit because I wasn't so backlogged with commissions and you know maybe it wasn't like the most lucrative of conventions, but I think that uh, those were the more most fun conventions. For uh, me. Doing a show for Charlie with his crowd too. Those people are always great to hang out yeah, and talk yeah, to. For absolutely. Sure. The, no, the dangerous thing is like I want to buy everything. <laughs> everything, everything, adventure. right? No, for sure. <laughs> I, I think I spend more money at Dink than I do some of the bigger shows, definitely. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I think that's what the customer base is there, too, is just those are book buyers. That's why I'm not doing as many uh, caricatures because uh, right. I was I, actually the, the first Dink that I did, I sold more books than uh, at my first Denver Comic Con, which is where the zombie in the basement debuted. 
which I was kind of ashamed of the Denver Comic Con for that. <laughs> right. Well, I think Charlie, you know, his show was focused when he started Denver Comic Con and was focused on such local talent and local creators. And for him to go do that, I think, smaller format thing yeah. show. And, and the actual craft said, you know, of the book, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to the, you know, the, the photo op. Right. Right. Yeah. A that's lot of definitely. The big conventions are built around the photo op. That's a good. That's a really good way to put it, without being without being like dreadfully honest about some of them. But Stan, it's StanYan.me is where you can go kind yes. of check out everything. You also mentioned the weekly comic strip was on what site? Uh, Sundayhaha.com. Sunday. Okay, so yeah. Sundayhaha.com. But if you go course, there, it just gets you to the page where you can sign up to get the reminder email that the next issue is out. Um, perfect. But you can you can follow all my social media and and probably get the link for me that way too. <laughs> right. And your mailing list is still very active so people can sign up and kind of, I mean, kind of, okay. there was this, uh, I think the GDPR requirement from the EU where you couldn't add someone to your mailing list without their permission. And so it basically kind of wiped out my old mailing list. I, I sent out a mass email saying, you know, unless you, um, you know, you, uh, opt in and say, yes, you want to stay in my mailing list, then I'm not going to email you anymore. So that kind of culled a lot of my email list. But if you go to my website and, and sign up and just check to say, yeah, you want to, then you'll get my infrequent blog post email. You you. <laughs> infrequent. infrequent though. All right. Well, we'll share all those links for sure in the post and hopefully we'll run into you soon. But was there any last things you wanted to plug, talk about? or? Uh, we well, I think by the time you publish this uh, free comic book day will be done and over with. But right, yeah. I, I'm, I'm pr printing a Peter Cadaver uh, mini comic to give away at free comic book day. But I've, I'm going to have um, I'm going to set aside a hundred of them for a, uh, uh, a bookstore event that I'm doing at a brand new bookstore up in Niwot, Colorado called the uh, Wandering Jellyfish on October 30th. So I'll have a, a hundred of them to give out there. And then if you go trick or treating at my house, I'll have some for you there as well. <laughs> That's there awesome. <laughs> I also love the name of that bookstore, the Wandering Jellyfish. That's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's really fun. Awesome. Well, Stan, it's been a pleasure. Uh, for those of you tuning in, definitely check out StanYan.me. Also, make sure you subscribe, turn on the notifications, and leave us any comments you want to right here on our YouTube at ProjectNerd.Live. That's Project-Nerd.Live. And of course, all of this content that we do, the video content, the podcast content, cosplay posts, blog, event coverage is all over at ProjectNerd.com, Project-Nerd.com. Uh, if you're already there, obviously just look around and see what else is happening. But Stan, it was a pleasure. Aaron, I'm so glad you could join us for one. So excited I could be here. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for having but, um, me. I will talk to y'all soon. And for everybody else, have a good one.